thy knife chip and shatter. Uh, I'm gonna start now. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Ruben, formerly known as Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron and Teddy, and we are back to talk about Dune Part Two. Spoiler discussion. I am so excited to talk about this movie. I've seen it a few times. I know you guys have seen it now. Well, Teddy's seen it now. I know Aaron's seen it a few times. And a movie that we've been anticipating, the world has been anticipating, Dune fans have been anticipating for like 60 years. A lot of them didn't like the Lynch movie, but they seem to like the Villeneuve. Although some book readers are being annoying, but that's how book readers are. Bunch of nerds. Uh, Aaron. Teddy. How's it going? What's up, man? Hey, Aaron. Hey, Teddy. Yeah. This... This movie was exceptional. Oh, I mean, you're going to say, okay, well, follow yeah. us on social medias at Twitter, Instagram. <laughs> oh, I, thought, Nerd Soup, yeah, I thought you were throwing Soup. it in. At Teddy, Teddy Nerd Soup. Uh, uh, yeah, he just jumped right into it, huh? Yeah, dude, we're just like shaking. The ref's going through the, <laughs> he's going over the rules, good sportsmanship. You're already <laughs> d'ing up. <laughs> Slapping uh, the floor. Why don't you have a clean fight? <laughs> you fucking decks him right in the face. <laughs> I want to get my thoughts out first before Aaron says everything. Then I can't say my two second uh, what I thought about the movie. <laughs> yeah, floor is yours. Well, now yeah, no, go on. ahead. Uh, what do you think, Ted? Just saw it last night, right? Yeah, I was. Well, I for uh, one think it was an excellent movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was right. fired up through the movie, dude. Timothy Chalamet was phenomenal. He had me ready to run through a wall. He topped the first one, and the first one was really good. And he had to top the first one to put him in the uh, to put this sequel up there with the greatest sequels and he did it was non-stop I, I felt like there wasn't a wasted scene the whole the whole movie the acting the action the landscape shots it was just it was almost every scene that was a great shot or there was great acting or great action it was insane seeing your reaction was pretty funny last night <laughs> i could just see how pumped you probably were in the movie theater and just watching everything take place but every um, turn everything that happened i turned to ruben and he just started laughing i was i just i couldn't believe what i was watching Dude, no, I the best turns. Uh, sorry to cut you off, Aaron. When yeah, no. Lady Jessica would do something freaky. Teddy would turn to me and just like stare. It's like, is that serious? <laughs> no, when you when he when he hit the Reverend Mother with a silence, I was like, Whoo. yo, I jumped like, back in my seat, man. He got me to shut up. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but yeah, even when I saw it alone, I was kind of like looking around the theater to see everybody else's reaction, kind of hoping to like live through them. Because I knew everything that was coming, just to see what how everyone else was feeling uh, during that movie. But I think that moment, and well, basically the whole third act, I think everyone was just at the edge of their seats. And I think that's the takeaway for most people is like once he and obviously spoiler discussion, so we'll just get into it. Like once he drinks the water of life, from that moment on, and that third act begins, it is just nonstop. It is such a satisfying uh, payoff from. Not only this movie, but uh, from part one as well. Just to see this character take the, make the decisions that he does, and see where how he's progressed into this moment, it's pretty fascinating. And then when you look at it in a deeper level, I think that's actually the most fun part. Is uh, after the movie, you're kind of caught up into this whirlwind of just decision making, action, suspense, and then you're like, "Fuck!" And you're rooting for him, and yeah, Paul came out on top, and you're like, "Wait." That's not a good thing, is it? It kind of just takes you by surprise and makes you it kind of that's what that's the that's like kind of the aspect that like kind of sticks with you after uh, every time I think back on that movie, just thinking about like in that own little vacuum, we had this great kind of hero story. But then when you kind of look back on some of the things, you're like, eh, maybe he's not the hero we kind of uh, thought he was. I think he does what's necessary for him. And, you know, he, sure, he realizes what he has to do. Sure. Yeah, like, I think, but that's the fun part. Of it. Thing. That's the fun part about like the movie and the discussion around it. It's like I think a lot of people have many different opinions. Like I, think I, I think, which makes it a fascinating story and a fascinating character. And to your credit, uh, to your point before, like Chalamet, and I think a lot of people's takeaway from this movie is that yeah, like we knew he was great going into it and had the potential to be a star for years to come. But I think this is the movie. This is the role that like kind of solidifies him and like cements him going forward as like yeah he's probably going to be here for a long time yeah my favorite uh chalamet moment was when uh stilgar was telling him the only way you can talk is if you take my place and he interrupts him and he's like i'm pointing the way and everybody oh was God, like dude. 
Bro, that whole scene. With, that uh, scene was phenomenal. Just oh, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the moment where he does, you know, fully become the Kwisatz Haderach. But yeah. I think those lines to be that confident and that strong in your delivery, it's not easy. Because everybody says, oh, it's just kind of Chalamet doing what he does in all of his roles. Just lounging around, uh, bad posture, kind of depressed. Yeah, because you also have to command the room. You have to command yeah. it. You know, you can't just half-ass that. You have to actually feel that from him to sell that role. And he made me feel like he was in charge, not just from the movie. Like, he was just so assertive. And it yeah, made and me dude, feel like, like the way they there. incorporated what he's learned about the past, not only his own life, but the history of Arrakis, which has been such a mystery to all these people, you know, the Harkonnens, maybe they're just kind of incompetent. They didn't even realize <laughs> that there were millions living in the South. But him telling that story to the oh, fundamentalist who takes out his knife and he says, you probably think you could challenge me, but you're scared. You're praying. What is this? What if this is the moment that you've been waiting for? And he tells him about his great, great ancestor, about when the planet used to be called Dune. It was That's just a perfect them. way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like, fuck, this guy knows ball. <laughs> <laughs> and it started out as funny and then it gets a bit more uh, worrying. Stilgar's commitment to Paul. So even as soon as Paul says Dune, Stilgar's the first one to go, Lisa, how can you? Yo, every <laughs> and one he of kept those throwing that out there. Dying. <laughs> but even as it goes on, like even at the end when he's like, when the rival houses come and he makes that decision, like the Lisa and Al Gaib he lets out there, I think it's just, it's kind of the same reaction he's been having since the beginning of the movie. But it, in this context, it's completely different. And were those, like, I think that's when he what, said those, were those meant for comedic payoffs or like, were they like, is that just how he said it? Like at times, I, but like, I think at the end, it's more of like a, it's more frightening because of like just seeing the grip that Paul now has on these people to basically convince them or man manipulate them to wage war like at a moment's notice. So I think like as it progresses, it does start out funny, but it gets a little bit more sinister as we get deeper into this. And that's just going back to like what I was talking about before. It puts the viewer in a, a, a weird place. And I think Villeneuve like does a great job at this because like in this story, like when they take back uh, Arrakis for the Fremen, like, yeah, obviously you're rooting for him and he's a hero in that moment. But I think what like that entails and what that means for the future, that's kind of the sinister note that we're left on. And I think that's a great uh, way to end this film is with Chani, obviously with one of the, the one character that we see throughout the film that is kind of cognizant of what's kind of going on and what this could lead to. And she's really the only one that's not fully bought in or kind of can see She's the, not blinded by the least on Akai, like she yeah. she's looking ahead and knows what's what's to come now that this has all happened. Right, exactly. So like leaving it on that note with the the ships going into the atmosphere, I think is such a a beautiful ending. Um and go figure, like, huh? Beautiful ending for that. Everyone's going into war. <laughs> like, Could you imagine? In in terms of like just like visually and i think yeah. like it sets up a part three so like so great i feel like if you're leaving the theater or you don't really know what's going on outside it's like you would just assume like yeah we're getting part three like in a year right i want it like tomorrow <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think chani was being a little hard on paul man i mean she knows what he's dealing with she knows that he was trying so hard not to do this and fate was just you know you can't stop fate and it was just like I just feel like she was being a little hard on him. Well, I know in the books, I think it's a different route um, where she has a different, I think you can attest to this too, Ruben. Uh, Teddy, maybe not. I don't think you got to that part yet. No, not when yet. You, you're still halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you start the first one yet? Me? Yeah. I actually did. I got like a page and a half in last night. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, uh, what was I saying? But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure in the book, like I think she's like, on board with his decisions so that's a that's a change but yeah yeah there's a, and i think that works for dramatic effect because uh, right. it makes her character stand more on her own and there's a couple of lines between them i think she even says that choices have been made for us and that's what uh pulling down the curtain and showing the audiences how the benny jesuit have been planting this propaganda for centuries on this planet it makes it seem in the in part one that it's something that they had done when they realized uh, the Atreides were going to take over Arrakis. But, you know, it, it just goes to the Imperium's politics that Arrakis can't be terraformed because this spice is so valuable. 
So we're going to plant the idea that, yeah, maybe one day it can. So we could keep the Fremen at bay. They don't get too unruly and we can still mine this spice and use it for our benefit, the aging benefits and the and the travel benefits. So I like that they made Chani a bit more. A little rebel. Yeah, I guess kind of like a rebel. You know, going realist. against the establishment there, the Fremen establishment. You know, that was a standout performance too from Jessica Ferguson. I think she was great in it. And you Rebecca know, Ferguson. Rebecca Ferguson. Sorry, them. yeah, you got him confused. Uh, That's what Reverend with Mother. The story, you, you know, they were trying to set up how she had her hand in this whole thing and she was pulling all the strings. And then she comes to find out that she was never pulling any strings and it was all the Reverend Mother. Oh, yeah, dude. I mean, her transformation in this movie after she drinks the water of life, and it happens to Paul too, where she becomes way more committed to the cause. And that one scene when she's talking to Paul's younger sister. Oof. And uh, they're talking about how they need to start with the weaker ones and they need to convince them, the ones who fear them. She just goes full blown villain. And by the end, when she's sitting on her throne and she has that confrontation with the emperor's Benny Gesserit and says, you pick the wrong side. She gets a little cocky there. She's taking her victory lap. No, she she's the best. Um, that's why that's probably my favorite part of the movie. Like what, you said, that, no, just Lady Jessica and her. Oh her politicking and the way she kind of maneuvers and and the voice was so much scarier in this one hell yeah just jump scares every time like when she bullies chani into saving paul (laughs) do it (laughs) no i got emperor Uh, vibes bro or when uh the old reverend mother when they're transferring powers and she doesn't (laughs) they're like you will drink this and you will die and lady jessica's like wait what you said i'll I'll die (laughs) no i'm good i'm good on that (laughs) Yes, <laughs> dude that scene might be my favorite scene in the movie because it was just so creepy and i talked about it on the non-spoiler just the cutting between lady jessica spazzing out uh the fetus combining with the water of life it was all of and that the reverend mother and the women and the way that they were like uh, howling almost it was the just witches a, bro yeah yeah the, like the witch seance. ceremony yeah no it was amazing just absolutely Bro, I had amazing, vibes from the, the the womb was a witch. It was like Jesus. You you make it. You're no, making she, me hate she, a womb. She was bitching out Paul like at every other turn. Right. <laughs> She's yeah, like when, Michael yeah, Irvin. When when Paul's talking to Jessica and he's like he's talking to the womb to Jessica and the womb is talking back to Paul. It's like that's a weird. It's amazing. It was, yeah, it was so creepy, dude. And I said it I on can the definitely see non-spoiler. why you said what you said. How like the other books get freaky and like it might not like it might be too much to do. Just this was creepy. Like the whole uh harkening scenes with Austin, with Austin Butler and I, I think he was a standout for the little time he had like on the screen for like that third act. I oh, think he was, he was amazing. He really owned that role. No, I think all the all the I think all the performances, especially the returning cast from the first one, they, were, they definitely approved upon and all the newcomers really brought it too. So like on that front, I think from top to bottom, I think the whole cast was phenomenal. But yeah, going back to that like Th- those moments like especially that when she does drink the water of life uh, that was one of the standouts to me a lot of people point out the uh increased humor in this film but i think the horror elements are really what was most captivating and a lot of that is brought in through lady jessica and, and the benny jezebel as a whole they just have a scary vibe even um what was it margo leah sado's character yeah um that whole sequence in the hallway with austin butler that was fucking incredible Oh, yeah, dude. And I love the way he shot that when Lady Margot, when you fe- first see her in the room with uh, Fade Rotha, and you can't really tell that she's got her arms and back exposed. And then when she brings him to the guest room, and you can tell that she's about to seduce him. So that whole sequence, the way it was shot, it was maybe the sexiest thing Villeneuve has ever done in his career. It was steamy and sexy for a Villeneuve. Oh, my God. Yeah, I was getting <laughs> me going in theater, dude. I was like, I'd follow her, too. Are you kidding? You can't yeah, blame him, bro. They, they're trying to, to uh, say, yo, they, they were trying to say that he was like a thirst trap. I'm like, come on. I mean, you see what you see what he was chasing? Not a thirst trap. Yeah, I can't talk. <laughs> I, I would have joined Lady Jessica's cult in a fucking set heartbeat. Yeah, are you kidding? I love when she asked uh, the Reverend Mother, why didn't you do it? <laughs> like, well, I'm a motherly figure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Like, well, you're a lot hotter. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to say it. I couldn't. We're I don't know about you guys, here. but I couldn't really take. Uh, Benny Jesuit Turbo Pussy got me acting on wise. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said it was actually the Atreides nuts that had Lady Jessica act in Defiant. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I wish she was just like. <laughs> uh, well, what did talking. you guys? Uh, uh, go yeah. ahead. 
No, nah, never mind. Go. Wait, hold on. I I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't really take Christopher Walken serious as the Emperor. I've heard that from a lot of people, and I really liked him. You yeah, did I like him? I don't know. I just felt like he's one of he those guys like f- that I look at, unless he has like a main role in being serious, I just see him as a comedic center. He's been in so many, like, uh, well, that's why he's such a good actor, because he can do both. He can do the goofy comedy. He can play the loving father figure like he is in Catch Me If You Can. I think that's his best performance. He what this reminded me of was that uh the ping pong movie Bulls of Fury where he played like the emperor in that one too. And I just I just thought of that like when I saw him in the movie. Well, I thought he was such a good choice because he looked like a fragile old man way past his prime still clinging to power. And I thought, right. boy, that's just such a great metaphor for today. You have all these old ass leaders who just won't give it up. You know, he betrays someone that uh the princess said that he loved like a son. Essentially weak, somebody man. he raised as a successor. Wait, are you saying the Emperor was weak? No. Uh, but see, Lego. I love this Lego shot when when Paul finally kills the Baron and you look over and you see the Emperor cowering behind his guards. He looked so vulnerable and afraid. And I think Walken just had the perfect look for that. Dude, a man standing been, on the top of a crumbling empire. I would have been afraid too. Tim, Timothy, like the amount of, like you said before, the confidence he has in that swag, third act. Bro. Dude. He, no, the way he, dude, a fade Rotha was getting turned on. Oh, yeah. When he silenced the <laughs> Reverend Mother, he was like, <laughs> Bitch. Like, he's ba- he's basically like, I wasn't familiar, familiar with your game, and he liked it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Give him a little He was getting turned race. on by his uncle getting killed. Um, <laughs> I, in, the, in the moment, I kind of wanted fade Rotha to beat him because, like, I feel like he was feeling himself, like, too much. Like, he was on a heat check I've never seen before, just chucking up logo threes and all of them are just cash, 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 yeah, he cash. Was on 10. He was on 10. <laughs> I, right wa- I wanted him to get humbled so bad. He, even though, he was getting messy. Even, he was getting messy. Even, even though you want him to win. But yeah, that moment when he goes up and he kills him on the stairs to the throne and he kind of like has that little tilt and he's walking slowly towards and he looks at the princess and she kind of flinches back. Like the control he has over those moments is truly incredible. Like I said, like... Uh, I didn't think he was bad in the first one, but and that maybe just be an artistic choice for the character for uh, him to not be as convincing as he is here, obviously, because he hasn't really come into this himself into this position yet. But when he takes it, he just never lets go. And the performance just shines through here. I think this is going to be like a truly defining moment of his career. Like, yeah, this might be his best performance to date. But like, I think this is the one we look back at and just like, yeah, this is when he became like. He's already a star, but this is might just put him into another level. I think this movie hits a billion. No. You don't think so? I, I mean, would it's... love, absolutely love for it to hit a billion. We'll see what the, I mean, I think next week's going to tell a lot. If the, if the fall off from opening weekend is, isn't that bad, then I think it could be seven eights, but a billion might be tough. Yeah, I think it's uh, supposed to settle at like 80 million for the weekend, which is really good. And I think it will have legs. I don't know how long it's going to be in these IMAX theaters, but that should boost it. Well, yeah, I mean, shit, $25 a ticket. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. Well, dude, that's why the RPX that we have uh, over over in Westbury, it's clutch, man. Big screen, not as big as the IMAX, but better sound. Does popcorn sales and, uh, go into this? Uh, into what it makes? No. Like that's no, a it does not. Huh? Oh, you think the Dune bucket should count? Yeah, it should. <laughs> it doesn't. I don't think so. Those TV shirts, no TV shirts. Those uh, those shirts that they were selling might might count. <laughs> Dude, my one of my favorite scenes of the movie after Paul drinks the water of life. And he's talking about, he's seeing all these different timelines. And he's like, there's a narrow way through. And you get that one glimpse of him stabbing Fade Rotha. And you realize, yeah. once again, like in the first movie, he's seeing all these timelines with Jamis, But that's not how it happened. But here, you know, he realizes that he has to essentially lose in order to win. Because it's such a, you would think it would be a close to a lethal blow. The reactions from Chani and Stilgar and Jessica, they're like, holy shit, we did all this just for this motherfucker to die? Yeah. <laughs> the reaction I love made it look like he lost. So one of my critiques would be, I wish some of the visions would have went into what we might see in the next movies. Because it looked they did that in part one. There's a scene where it's uh, Chani and Paul returning to Caledon after the Holy War. So I, I was anticipating that they would give us into, some glimpses into what Dune Messiah could look like. Nothing crazy. 
but just like a, some scatter shots and then some callbacks because they did that in part two, like when Johnny's talking about how beautiful Arrakis looks, it sounds like the exact same voiceover and I'm sure it is. So I was a little disappointed by that, but I really did love how, how much weirder it got with the water of life. You know, like the woman who traps the baby worm and kills it and takes the water out looking like some fire ass power raid. I love weird shit like that. You know, where they're, ch- they're saying things that are, you don't understand them, but it's their religion and the, the, the rituals, the ceremony. The world building in this one, it made me feel like I was in, like I'm part of that society. Like it was that good. Like the way Dude, they were that opening scene, the sand their looked, ways. sorry to cut you off. I'm just so yeah. excited about the sand. It looked like you could eat it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it looked appetizing like you could just scoop it up like ice cream and it, just everything about the world feels so ancient and old like these are traditions that have been passed down by generations to generations and I think that, that that's why the water of life lady represents that so well like she's been trained her entire life by people who are equipped with centuries of learning to do exactly this job and you know she, she gives off that caretaker with no other ambition no other purpose other than doing exactly this it made me feel like I was part of their society. Like I was Paul. Like it made me feel like I was being taught all about their ways. It wasn't just them teaching Paul. Like it just made me feel like I was in this with them and I was in that world. Yeah. And all those little details about the culture, about the history, they bring your world roaring to life. You're just not building it. You're convincing us that these structures, that these traditions, these rituals have existed for hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of years. Because even these are once shot, a, even. Like, Go ahead. With the, this is like a little one-off. It was, but it was when Chani shot down the chopper, and she was making the run to the next lake. Like awesome. You just heard the giggle like, that she you, lets you heard out. Her laugh, like as she's yeah. running, like, like how happy she was. Like you know, I what love I mean? that just, every single time. She's like, ha, she yeah, can't believe it. Like that. <laughs> no, that, that sequence was fucking incredible. Like such a like even the the action sequence in the um the first movie uh centered around the spice uh collecting they just elevated it to a different level here obviously it's a different scenario where it's actual fight going on and not just trying to escape but the suspense he was able to build in that moment in a scene where you know you're pretty early in a movie you know chani and paul are probably going to make it out alive but still able to create that suspense in that sequence there um like even just the way the guns worked and the camera zooms every time there was like a, a binocular or a, a zoom or telescope device used. Uh, I thought those shots are all super well done. Um, yeah. Like of the Baron when they were in the stadium, like, yeah. That was sick. <laughs> yeah. When uh, Margo's looking across at the Baron or even looking at the fight through the, the lenses. But yeah, that sequence was great. And the opening sequence with the anti-gravity suits or whatever you would call them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude. Just I, such I a kind gr- of felt those are weird. Like the way they fly around. I don't know what it what it is about that. I think it's just because it's so quiet. That's it's so that's what the best part is. I guess, but I don't know. For me, it looked a little weird. Not not your favorite, that I don't like it. I your just favorite think it scene weird. in the first Dune is when it got quiet <laughs> because of that little device. Oh know. yeah, when the Sadakar were uh, coming down real low. Yeah, that wasn't my favorite scene. My favorite scene was when they were talking in the uh, yeah in the, in the the silent chamber. Yeah, You're no, I'm just saying guy. it looks weird, like the way they that they fly around. Oh, I thought it was awesome. Yeah, I'm not saying I didn't like it. out like that, dude. Lady Jessica looking like a fucking monster on the top oh, of that sh- dune when she smashes the dude's head in. Well, Paul, once again, it's like, did Paul, when he was sleeping, did he see like, oh, I can put my back to the open because Lady Jessica is going to have my back. I'm that far ahead at this point. I mean, the way I take it is like he, he can see different outcomes, but he doesn't really know which one's going to happen. So I feel like, I don't know, it's probably a lot going on in his brain. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that they leave a lot of little fun things for you to just kind of make up in your head. This could be a possibility. That could be a possibility. Like yesterday when I was watching, I got distracted because I was thinking of these Benny Gesserit putting in work for this prophecy for this long. (laughs) You know, they didn't spare any detail. They just absolutely nailed it. Like when Chani realizes her name is a metaphor for how Paul is going to come back to life. (laughs) Desert, Uh, what was it? Desert Spring? Desert Spring. Yeah, and every time the, a new detail like that would uh, pop up, Stilgar went crazy for it. But wh- I wanted to comment on, uh, you know, when Paul finally takes charge and becomes uh, the Mahdi. And Stilgar well, asks him. Worm? No, no, no. Uh, the ceremony when he's talking oh. to all the leaders in the South. Stilgar's face when he asks him, w- you know, what's going to happen next. That face of fanaticism is so scary because there are tears welling up in his eyes and he's smiling. But he also looks like he's ready to just kill anybody for this man 
And yeah. that one shot, when everything shifts, it, it just becomes darker and a bit more scary. And his performance captured that. I mean, everybody's obviously making the jokes, like just the greatest hype man of all time. Yeah. But that scene, it's generally funny when he was just like, look how humble he is. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that one was really funny. <laughs> but yeah, like seeing... I think giving that character a little bit more personality was a, a a huge upgrade from the first one. But like you said, when the tone shifts, like it becomes almost almost frightening. And I think that's just why this movie kind of separates itself uh, from the first one. And a lot of people are, are considering it to be one of the best sequels of all time, which after seeing it a second time, like maybe uh, after the first time seeing it, I was still like caught up in everything. But Given a week seeing it again, like I, I think it, for me, it, it is one of the best sequels of all time. Probably one of the I, best movies of all time, from in my opinion. I have to watch it again. I feel like, I mean, you guys seen it multiple times, and I, I think I, I know your answers, but you're definitely gonna find more shit out as you watch the sec- like when you watch it for a second time, right? Oh, sure. A little like even the third act, like uh, when I left it, like obviously. Um, throughout the film, like the warnings from Paul and his hesitancies about going south and his visions, like, you know, that when it ends, like it's definitely more than meets the surface when it comes to like, oh yeah, the good guys won. Good job. Let's clap. And you know, everything's going to be okay from here on out. But I feel like the first time I was watching, I was so much more caught up in kind of like in a Stilgar sense, like viewing Paul as like this, this, a hero, like we view, uh, like the Luke Skywalkers of the worlds um, and the classic protagonists that we're all used to. And then the second time I was watching it, I viewed it more from like a Chani perspective of like kind of picking out the little nuances of the, you know, the potential dangers that lie ahead and kind of seeing the reactions from characters like Stilgar and the people who decide to follow him and just kind of see the danger in it. Yeah, because in Chani said that he's becoming everything he said he didn't want to be. And it's, just, it's almost like he lied to her completely. Like, no, I just think to, that's just, just to get to where he is. And then now he's flipping the switch. I think they both kind of realize she even says it when he's refusing to go south that he's afraid of the fundamentalists. I think a lot of it is just um, going back to the line choices have been made for us. Reality and time, they, they've just blended together in a way where nobody can make sense of anything anymore. They don't realize they, they don't know if they're making these choices because they want to make them or to somebody else or to somebody else even beyond that, like the reveal of Jessica being a Harkonnen. You know, it, Jessica's portrayed throughout this movie as someone who's got her feet planted. She knows exactly what she wants to do. And right. then it's revealed, oh, you're actually a pawn in this as well, because you were ripped from your family. You're a part of the crossing the bloodlines between royal houses, and you didn't even know that. Well, so yeah, the, you might think that you're bringing this prophecy to light, but you're just doing what you've been put there to do well, by somebody else. The, the best lines is like, well, we're Harkonnens, so let's be Harkonnens. Like, I think that's kind of right. just sums up. Um, yeah, that's the transition there. When he's saying all, that, though, he's saying to be like cold-blooded, right? When you said that? Oh, yeah, yeah. To yeah. rule through, instead of ruling through the heart, like his father, rule through right. just fear and chaos and brutality. We kind of like showing, there's a couple of cool parallels. Obviously, the fight sequence with Paul, the vision in the first movie. I think that parallel with Chani was fucking awesome. When I was watching it the first time, I was like, oh, fuck. Like, that's the thing from the, the other one. Um, yeah, I'm glad they also, changed that suit too, because uh, the suit in the first movie was kind of goofy. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of fucked with it. Um, Which one? The gold suit. Oh, it looked yeah. like uh, Wonder Woman 1984. But um, no, the even with Paul, suits, they need a fucking upgrade, dude. They're, they're, they're like blocks walking around sand. Come on. <laughs> but also, Jesus. when Paul's dad, what does he say to him in the first movie? Like a leader, like like a good leader isn't one that wants. Yeah, he's to called lead. to it. He's called to it. Um, and seeing kind of Paul, like in a way, sure he's called to it. But there, you get a sense that at the end, like no, he wants this. Like he makes that. I think something just flips in his brain where like he was the reluctant leader at first, didn't want to go south. But once he's there, he sees he drinks the water of life. He sees what could be. And I think he's just completely bought in, which is another scary prospect. Um, I'm watching this documentary on Alexander the Great. And like, there's a moment where like, once he convinces himself that he's a god, that's when he becomes terrifying. Because it's one thing for 
he believes your followers in to followers to have that belief. But once you believe it yourself and think yeah. you're invincible, you can do no wrong. Everything I do is right because this is the way it's supposed to be. And you that's can sell it, it becomes, too. That's when it becomes dangerous. You know, I loved when uh, I think Gurney came in at the perfect time as like a change of pace. He wants to come in guns blazing. And it took him two seconds to be like, I know where the nukes are. I know. <laughs> I know exactly. When they're walking into the siege, everybody's being quiet and respectful. How many men you got? <laughs> 200. Oh, oh, that's another thing I love. That aspect of like, the, they got a little 300 crew running around just wrecking shop. Oh, man. When they're hiding in the sand, they pop out. It's just so well crafted. All these sequences look oh, so Oh, what they're like that breathing mask, like that's sticking out the yeah. top. Going back... I feel like we're just jumping around, but before I want to say it before I forget it, I think one great shot that encaps- encapsulates a lot of what we're talking about is, you know, when Paul first walks back into the throne room, he's surrounded by Gurney, I think Stilgar, and Shani's off to the side, and you're kind of viewing him through her perspective. Um, I don't know what he does in that moment, but I could almost feel just like the disconnect between them in that shot, just by him walking past him kind of in the distance with her pushed to the side. I thought that was very well done and kind of just encapsulates everything that's going through her mind and kind of their situation and their relationship at that moment through that one shot. Um, yeah, there were a couple of good ones too, like when they all eventually bow to Paul and it's just Chani and Irulan standing. They see this new dynamic that they now have between them. Yeah, and an- another great shot too is when they're going up slowly over the dune and you see Stilgar. Uh, like, oh yeah, with, with all that- his boys in the background. <laughs> But he's squatting. Then you see all his boys with the Atreides flag in the background. A lot of great squats in this movie. Oh, Powerful damn. Positions. I was just about to say that. <laughs> I feel like I'm on the sand, yeah. in this movie. They perch like Spider-Man. But even at the end, you know, uh, to the point about Paul embracing what he has to do, a lot of it does come down to, I think, his love for his family. Because even when he takes his power, he still tells Chani, I'm going to love you until my last breath. So he hasn't been blinded to the point of, I'm um, not only am I better than all these people following me, but I'm better than those closest to me. It still comes down to protecting his family. And at the end of the day, this is the only thing that he can do to protect Chani, to protect Jessica, to protect his younger sister, Gurney, all these people that he now considers to be family, even Stilgar. So uh, I think that, yeah, he's, he's definitely a, a different man by the end of the movie in terms of how confident he is and how just like a, like similar to Jessica, his feet are planted. This is the path he is now walking. But uh, the way that it ended with that shot on Chani, I think was perfect for audiences because it leaves it ambiguous. What's going to happen here? She's obviously not going with the rest of the troops. And he just <laughs> offered to marry this princess. So... Yeah, perfect ending. And uh, Dude, I her think face that was... when he said, "I'll, I'll take, uh, I'll take your hand." Like you felt the pain that Chani felt with that face she made. Yeah, and there is a line she where still... he says earlier in the movie, "Eventually, she'll come around." I think I they would hope so. That. I mean, I would hope you understand the politics and what's going on. Right. That's I think that I think it's just natural to have. The... I don't think she was too hard on them. I think that those were just legit emotions. Where it's once again, you're trying to stop well, destiny. Get it together, it's man. Impossible. What are we doing here? Come on, the war. She's scared. She loves the guy. She doesn't want to see him become Hitler. <laughs> he's not yeah i think she also see uh I mean, he says that he's six billion people are gonna die if he goes south <laughs> literally I mean, he in the billions of want it to happen you know it, it had to happen i mean i felt like well no i, I think like that not- she's just worried it's more so not her being hard on him like the slap she thinks that she maybe by slapping him she can change destiny but that's all <laughs> she can do it's just uh her expressing emotion she's angry she's, she's scared cool. You just got to accept it sometimes, you know? Just roll well, with the yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Does he... Because, like, we're talking about, like, yeah, reluctant leader and stuff like that. But I feel like there's a path for him. Like, there is a path where this could all have been avoided, right? That's the that's thing I keep harkening back to with this character. It's like, at a certain point, like, he's just doing it because he feels like this is what he's... It's almost destiny at this point. Maybe he likes it. Oh, sure. I mean, I wouldn't be the first person to get caught up and want more power, but um, I feel like with everything else going on, a little bit more reasonable or trying to... Uh, maybe there isn't. Maybe there's some stuff in the books or some things I'm missing, but I feel like once you have Arrakis and you beat the Harkonnens, a way to mend the situation that doesn't call for you to be emperor and waging war on the other great houses. I feel like that's just part of him like feeling himself where he's like, fuck it. We want this far. Let's continue to roll. Yeah. I think the, that's 
part like if of his it, true goal you know, was to avenge his family and liberate Arrakis. I mean, once you're done with that, hang it up. Well, that's the thing. That's like with Duke Leto. Uh, somebody was making the point. Paul goes way past what Duke Leto wanted. Well, when you play these games, Arrakis isn't some fucking backwater. This is the most valuable planet in the entire empire. To act like people are just going to let you, you know, diplomatically or even through war and take control of essentially making yourselves the most powerful people in the world. And nobody's going to push back against that. Well, um, they said you know, it's in like, the movie that the other right, houses no, even in the fine. movie. Right. Exactly. Like, oh, we're just going to expose what the emperor did and everybody will get in line. And the other houses are like, fuck that. Nah, we dog. feel like you're vulnerable. This, he this didn't looks expose. like a power vacuum. Nah, dog. Us. I want Arrakis. <laughs> <laughs> did he even expose what the emperor did to the other houses? He just like tell them to I'm the emperor now. Tell them to like it. I think just the maybe, fact that he's alive. Maybe right? they maybe they would have been okay with him being like, okay, yeah, fuck the emperor. You got your revenge, but like now you're emperor. We didn't agree. To, we didn't agree to all that. <laughs> the final act is framed in a way where it's supposed to be this big triumphant moment, and it's kind of not. It's a bit more of a. This story Political. isn't over. Where is it heading? And I'm scared of what's beyond the horizon. So it yeah. feels kind of rushed. And I think that well, could be a benefit to the story. And then for other people, it can feel a bit more anticlimactic. But I kind of liked well, how rushed it was. Yeah, it kind of had the like the sense of urgency, right? But um, yeah. I do wish to battle when those worms or that shot of the worms just coming up and uh, decimating that army. Then you have Chani fighting on the battlefield. Like while I was watching this, I'm like, yo, this is some two towers, like best battle of all time type shit. And then it kind of just stops. Yeah, it ends. I could I wanted more big worms destroying stuff. Like it was like, I'm like, yo, this might be the best battle sequence I've ever witnessed right now. But it like that was only a minute into it. And then it's just, oh, that's all we got. And then, yeah, yeah, then it goes the battle totally sequence was Johnny running through. It wasn't really. Yeah. A lot of hand to hand combat. Then the next thing you see is Paul coming into the, the throne room. See, I, I do like that because I that like how it shifts too, to the Harkonnens and Emperor's perspective of just hearing what's going on outside, and then the door eventually gets blown down, and here comes Moadib. Yeah, I kind of do like it's just a fucking absolute bludgeoning. Yeah, well, you just hear <laughs> bang, bang. I love that they still didn't know who that was. Like, that was just a Moadib, and then he revealed himself. Like, oh, shit. See, I thought that was a great scene with Walken, too, when he's questioning the Harkonnens. Uh, he's he's like, just you know, so mad, man, in the south. <laughs> <laughs> well, he knows yeah, who it is, right? Yeah, at that point, he knows who it is, and he's trying to like weasel, uh, the, weasel it out of the heart. Yeah, but they genuinely, they genuinely don't know who it was. No, the heart. That's what's hilarious. They were stupid. So you've done no investigation into this. <laughs> Poor Robin. <laughs> All right, guys, before we move on to the second half of this podcast, we are going to take a quick break and shout out our sponsor for today's episode, and that would be ExpressVPN. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like riding a bike without wearing safety gear. You never know when a wild turkey is going to run out of the bushes and force you to crash while dislocating your shoulder, leaving you in a sling for months. I'm definitely not speaking from experience. ExpressVPN is the best option for those looking to stay safe on the internet. When you log into public networks, your sensitive data like banking information and passwords are at risk. Hackers can make up to $1,000 per person by selling your personal info on the dark web. But ExpressVPN creates a secure, encrypted tunnel between your devices and the internet. Their private network provides a layer of protection that keeps hackers at bay and keeps your sensitive data safe. And ExpressVPN, luckily for me, is very easy to use. It's dummy proof. So all I have to do is fire up the app, click one button, and I'm protected. And that's why it's become my go-to VPN, not only because it keeps me safe, but because it's very easy to use. Plus, it works on all devices like phones, laptops, tablets, and more, so you can stay secure on the go. So head on over to expressvpn.com slash nerdsoup to secure your online data today. That's expressvpn.com slash nerdsoup, and you can get an extra three months free expressvpn.com slash nerd soup and be on the lookout for any wild turkeys that's my hacker metaphor what, what did you guys think about dave bautista screaming he's just such a that's what i liked like the the contrast between him and uh fade ratha just like he's just big dumb strong guy <laughs> where fade is just like Fade's An immensely like, more terrifying figure than he's more bigger. terrifying, but he's not more strategic. He's just doing the same thing that 
Batista's guy was doing. <laughs> Dude, that's such a funny part when he uh, good old clo- fashioned he, no war, he, whatever he said. War yeah, after. when he bombs like their headquarters, <laughs> and Baron's like genius. That's, that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, is it? Like he just bombed the place. It's like, oh, what a, what a brilliant military s- strategy. Um, well, that hurt me. After we get all the information about the, oh yeah. Uh, with the, the way that they the collect well. the water, right? Yeah, the wells, and uh, just seeing the destruction over that site that was so important to all the Fremen is so disrespectful. You know, it goes beyond just trying to wipe them out. You're trying to wipe out their culture, what they believe in, what they worship, right? Uh, and that scene when Stilgar is showing her the water, those uh, lines of dialogue when he's talking about none of us um, dying of thirst would even think about drinking this water. And, and then uh, when, when he wipes her tears, don't waste your tears on on the dead. Is that what he said? Yeah, never give your water away, even yeah. for the dead. That's some shit that would happen to Teddy. Like he would what? just run in, like being stranded to the desert. Like, oh god, water! Finally, <laughs> Finally. starts <laughs> chugging it, <laughs> and the fremen just surround him, butt naked, <laughs> smashing <him> around. <laughs> yeah, take, you, know, a dip. <laughs> you know that was. No, uh, Batista's character. That was one thing I didn't like is that he was pictured as the first and in, in the first and second one as this big, bad, badass fighter, and then Gurney takes him out in like two swings, and he's like this little coward that keeps running away, and he can't even fight. He did get walloped. I thought with Dave Bautista in the role, they would give him like a like a Fade Rotha moment where you think, oh, okay, this guy's a badass. Just one. Even the the fight with Gurney just uh, you know stabbed him right in the neck, and I guess that's some payback. I did love the line that he uh, look who's back from the dead. <laughs> and Gurney, I, I I liked a bit more in this one. Once again, I still wish they would have got some ugly guy, but uh, him playing uh, his his little song, and even that action sequence. Luckily, Paul was the first one there in the sand. Oh uh, yeah, or else Gurney would have been toast. But uh, yeah, once he, you know, Stilgar's got the fanaticism, and with Gurney, it's the other side of that coin where he's obviously not religious. You know, he makes a point of never using the spice. He stays away from all the bullshit politics. But he's so devoted to the Atreides family that he's just basically giving him the same advice that Stilgar is: war is inevitable. It's time to uh, to buck up here, buddy. And yeah, Tony got, got outnumbered, man. She was tight when when Gurney came in the picture. Well, yeah, he encourages him to use, you know, don't believe it, but use it to your advantage. Yeah, but he was so lo- like, because he d- he doesn't know what Paul's been going through, so it was like to him, all of this just happened. So it was like, what do you mean you you're not ready? You don't want to get payback and all this? I was like, you know what I mean? Like he was just right, so out right. of it. Yeah, he like, can't Paul, see. Paul you know, he knows it. war is coming, but he doesn't understand what the holy war entails. Right. That what they're playing here with is not simply, uh, you know, imperial politics. This is some religious destiny type of those. I Benny just love Jezzeret, that. Like, they're fuck- I love that the Reverend nobody- Mother's playing this like it was never going to happen. And then now this, it's all happening to them. Well, they're funny as fuck because they're like, oh, we got this other guy that we can actually control. <laughs> <laughs> He's a bit of a sociopath, but that's fine. Killed his own mother. Does nobody think like maybe we shouldn't have the Benny Desert a- around? It- it's broad daylight and they're walking around in all black. How do you not have them around though? I mean, come on. Eh, maybe I'll just go. You know, I'll just stick with what I got. <laughs> they see the future, dude. I'd I'd want them around. Of course, yeah. yeah. No, you're exactly you Le- why the Benny Desert are still in power. <laughs> if you had a Rebecca Ferguson or Leah Siddell whispering in your ear, you're keeping them around. Absolutely. Sure, you're but shoo? You, if you're the you're emperor, shoo that off? Charlotte Rampling, I mean, uh, eventually. <laughs> I mean, she's, she's fantastic. Hang it up soon, right? <laughs> Dude, yeah, you the know old, the old one, the Fremen head? Yeah. I know, right, exactly. I'm not listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> Which, oh, man. Dude, you know who I thought le- uh, left a great impression? Chani's friend. Um, Oh, she's yeah, played spy? by Shahila Yakub. Yes. Yeah. yeah. At first I was confused. I'm like, oh, was she like spying for the Harkonnen? And I'm like, oh no. She was Yeah, and she went out like a boss. Spy, yeah. Didn't give a any hint of fear when she's about went to be like executed. She got burned alive, guy. Going out but, like a boss. What do you mean? She killed nine of them with one knife. I, yeah. That to what, you know. But I love that. I love when movies and shows they're like, oh, this awesome thing happened off screen. And we've seen her acting tough and fucking with Paul. She's obviously a doubter. She's uh, with Chani when it comes to that. But then 
she becomes buddies with Paul. And I think she's got some of the some of the better lines of the movie that not aren't necessarily funny, but bring levity to the characters in the story. Like when she tells him, like, hey, Moadib, don't embarrass us. Call a big one. So I thought for a character that, you know, has a few lines here and there, even when she gives him the nickname, like she tells him, like, oh, the Moadib loves your scent. And then he takes that as his warrior name. But the the worm riding scene, I guess we should just talk about that. I could watch that every day for the rest of my life in an IMAX theater. <laughs> that was, uh, and especially the one shot where he, he does it. So it's like, you're on the worm going over the dune when everything opens up and all the sand clears. But just the whole process of it, dude, it was amazing. Oh yeah, it's super cool. I mean, even. But they made it real, like they made it like real like whereas you can actually see how they can do it where it's like right, when you what first they were see doing. worms it's like there's no way they got on these things yeah. it's like oh all right so that makes i guess you can do it like that it's so funny and like when you see them later and they just have a whole community like a whole community, whole community on, on it yeah <laughs> on there. they have like little tents set up so, yeah they're just living on the worm yeah i was wondering how do they get all the people on the worm but then i, I didn't want to think too much about it he says he's got a an idea of how they dismount the worm that he wants mm. to show in the next movie <laughs> jump and roll yeah yeah but i thought dude everything about that like when um you see the size of the worm in the distance and everybody's freaking out and the little bridge creates and and he slides down and he's trying to get his footing and he's he's on the scales and he's opening it up and you see like those little like airways for the worm and the gusts of sand dude i was like there's no way that doesn't kill somebody (laughs) (laughs) probably feels like getting hit with a brick but it was it was amazing, dude, with the way that the score changes. Yeah, no, it was it was like that's what you're coming to this movie to see. Like you want to see in the book, like Paul rides a worm. It's like how are they going to do that on the big screen? And I mean, boy, even the score had me like just like it. They did such a good job where it just added to the, sus- the suspense. Yeah, the lady who does the Oz needs to release an EP. Oh, absolutely. Ah. No, you know what I love, dude? The opening Sardaukar throat quotes. Oh, yeah. Those are fucking sweet. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What are you listening to? Oh, yeah. I got the new throat new lady from, from, from Dune's album. And uh, once again, I don't know who Hans Zimmer stole some of these themes for for this movie. Uh, stole some of these themes from for this movie. But I love the love theme between Paul and Chani. Uh, and I mentioned it too on the the non spoiler. You know him playing tricks on the audience with his camera. Like when Paul looks up and sees the shadowy figure, and you hear Jamis's laugh, and then you hear Chani's voice. So I thought that was a nice little trick that he played on us. That he's still talking to Jamis while forming this relationship with Chani. What's what? I mean, Jamis is such a cool character, and he's like in in, in, in it for like what two minutes. <laughs> yeah, Both no, parts. he's got the best line I think in Dune Part One when he's like. Uh, Reality is not a problem to solve, or a life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. I guess those are alternate futures. Yeah, it always felt like, you know, he's seeing these these timelines where Jamis doesn't challenge him. Jamis survives and shows him the ways of the desert. He's, he's the one who pushes him into taking the water of life. Are you drinking Dang. the water of life? You think you got it? You got that in you? No. One drop would put me in a coma. <laughs> it did look fire, though. It looked like a nice slushy. It wasn't frozen. It, it, but yeah, but the color was so blue, it looked like a slushy. All right, you guys want to move on to some fan questions? Sure. I guess Aaron doesn't. If I said no, what, what would have happened? That's for the fan to decide. Yay! People, you call up to the show, you better be ready. That's what you're supposed to do. Sitting there arguing and trying to spell your name and all of this other stuff. It's not your show. It's my show. I'm giving you the, the opportunity to speak your mind. Don't call up here unless you got something to say. Um, okay. First question. Uh, from Matt Sampson. Well, actually, we did kind of answer this, but I guess we could get Teddy's answer for this as well. Favorite new addition to the cast? New addition just from this one or like that I think is because I, I think Austin Butler was probably my favorite. But he's dead now, so he has such a great like the, the accent he does, obviously he was trying to do like a Stellan Skarsgård. Um It was all putting when I first heard it though. But then I kinda it warmed up to me. You didn't like it? No, at at first at first it felt like it was like forced and like he was trying too hard. And then it kind of like he kinda owned the role and then it made it more believable. But it is funny because he kind of does look like like if Bill Skarsgård played that role, like it would have looked exactly the same. 
He did such a great job. I like Florence Pugh too. Yeah, Austin Butler was a uh, favorite for me, without a doubt. And like I said, I really liked uh, Chani's friend. Uh, Walken seems to be dividing people, but I I thought Walken was perfect. Like I said, I, I love the fragile old man who can see his t- <laughs> like he knows it's over for him, and he just refuses to give it up. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not sure who else you get. Like, I mean, I well, what did you think? Did you like Florence Pugh as uh, Irulan? Yeah, I did like her. She's another one where she's great. We've seen her in uh, in some some good things over the years now. But even with the limited time that she has in the dialogue, she uh, she makes her presence known. She's got that sort of quality that Chalamet has and Zendaya have as well. They're, they and feel great, like movie like, stars. Yeah, and great like awareness from her to be like, Denise told her like this is going to be a small role, but. Um, if everything goes well, you have a much bigger role in the next one. So taking a smaller role, even with Oppenheimer, kind of taking a smaller role as well. But you know, no, no one cares how small the role is if you just completely nail it. And right. now you look back at Florence Pugh, like just going Oppenheimer and Dune two back to back, like being in two of the best movies of the decade. Like what that does for your career and for your future and how people perceive you makes everyone forget about. Uh, Don't worry, darling. Yeah. And honestly, rewatching, uh, just watching. Don't worry, Dar- uh, don't worry, darling. She looks fantastic. She's the, so. well, she, she's the best part in that movie. <laughs> Her role wasn't that small in this movie, though. Florence Pugh's. I mean, that's not a tiny role, but it's not. No. But in, in in hindsight, to the movie, it's a pretty serious role. But yeah, what she means to. But when you look at it, like I feel like the princess character is maybe like seventh in terms right, of yeah. like, yeah. This movie definitely needed uh, subtitles because there were certain line deliveries where I'm like, there's no way people understood what that character just said. Like when Walken calls her, uh, he says, you, you, you'll be a formidable empress. But his delivery is so bad. <laughs> not, not that the, the, the delivery is bad, but you just can't make out what he's saying. And Austin Butler, too. Uh, once again, I love how he just did like a Skarsgård voice. He's like, I guess that's the Harkonnen accent. Just speak like Stellan Skarsgård. And Bautista you- <laughs> didn't get that memo whatsoever. <laughs> it's like, no, nah, I just talk like Bautista. Yeah, I really like the uh, dynamic between them, that she's just as important to the imperial politics as he is, that she's got some power. She's also working behind his back because her loyalty is more towards the Benny Gesserit. And she's way more, uh, you know, when you think of Paul, when you think of Chani, she's way more resigned to her fate. When the Reverend Mother tells her there's an option for you to stay in power, she immediately knows what she has to do. And she says that she's been prepared for it her entire life. So she's like a pig being led to slaughter, but she's also very clever. And she knows how to, up until this point, get the most out of her situation and get the most out of uh, and and do make choices that will benefit her and her family. But it looks like her luck has kind of run out here. <laughs> so she it's sad a- for that character. I don't know. I feel like she had to be rooting for Paul there. You want to marry Fade Ratha? Well, at the end of the day, it doesn't, you know, either way, you're just the queen yeah. to a, a conqueror. No, she wasn't rooting for Paul because if Paul wins, then, you know, that's their prophecy. That's, that's it. It's done. <laughs> the prophecy came to life. Yeah, but her father was getting removed from power anyway. Yeah, but she's about to step into a queen. I think with uh, Fade Ratha, maybe she would have had like a Marjorie Tyrell effect on him, sort of like with Joffrey. Whereas with Paul, the tough cookie to crack. <laughs> you know, Paul's so set in his ways. He's got his baby girl. Well, what, do you, what do you think like Fade's the... going to do? That's a worse life with Fade than with No, Paul. but with, like they said with Fade, you can uh, just manipulate him. Paul can't uh, be manipulated, okay. you know? Right, right, right. With Fade, is you can Lady... be like, oh, I'll rub your back if you don't kill me. Is Lady Jessica top dog now? Like, is she making the decisions when it comes to the Bene Gesserit? Or is it still... His sister, though, is she powerful or is that just what happens with Benny Gesserit and girls, like when they have girls in the womb? So, no, it's 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 the the water water of life. life. Yeah. Oh, shit. So, they, so (laughs) there's a womb in there that's like juiced up right now? Is that what this is? Oh, yeah. No, the water of life essentially just gives her immediate consciousness. (laughs) That's fucking weird, dude. Imagine being having a full consciousness, but like still have to be in the belly for nine months. Well, but Ruben, you were telling me that I guess it is a spoiler, but you said someone dies from the like it comes out of the womb and it's like a the baby kills him, right? Well, no, in the book, uh, so she I, I think they condensed it a bit because it's a few years that they spend on Arrakis fucking with the Harkonnen operation. So eventually, yeah. she's born, and she's just born as a fully sentient, conscious being who's 
giving Stewie? people advice. Yeah, essentially. So they kind of worked that in with her talking to uh, to Aaliyah without her being born. And to me, it was just so it was it was perfect for the movie because you're giving the audience exposition, but it's also just in- incredibly creepy when she oh, says yeah. she talks to me, and Paul's like, "What? <laughs> what the fuck?" What the fuck? <laughs> No, like you good. That's my favorite scene when she's. I think you mentioned it before when she's talking about how she has to manipulate the like start with the believers and then go for the non-believers, and she's just staring off into the distance with those bright blue eyes from the spice. Like, just such a harrowing scene, but so beautiful to look at. Yeah. So spoilers for the book. In the book, it's actually Aaliyah who kills the Baron. So Paul essentially sends her. She's basically working for Paul at this point. She sends him, uh, sends her as like an envoy, yeah, to the emperor and the baron. And it's like, hey, Paul's coming here with all his fremen. There's like millions of them. We have giant worms. Also, baron, here's a nice little poison dart in your neck. Also, baron, take this on your way out, man. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> but I kind of it fits better for the I think for this story to have Paul kill the baron. It's more satisfying for the audience, I think. And didn't he mention this? <laughs> you know what this? threw me off? When the Baron was crawling to the throne and he was wearing like dockers. <laughs> pull- yeah, that was funny. I didn't get that either. He, they showed his POV and he's looking at the throne and you get the sense that in his head he's thinking, if I make it to the throne, I'm going to be king or emperor. That didn't make any sense to me. Fade Rotha. Hark it in. <laughs> so yeah, they uh, for the Baron in that moment, I think that was just... He knows he's going to die. It's one last desperate attempt. Like the throne's right there. What if I, if I touch it, it's mine, right? That's the rule. That's, that's what, it, that's it what I'm thinking. Is that, <laughs> is that what the rule is? And yeah, uh, I think undo? it was just one last pathetic attempt at power. You know, everything's falling apart and he's still, he's still got this slither of hope. Like if yeah. I could just reach the throne, <laughs> it's like, it's over for you, Tubby. And Thurfir Hawat, he was the mentat for House Atreides. He does not appear in this movie. In the book, he, he does survive. And he comes under Harkonnen control. And it's actually his plan to help the Atreides prisoner fight against Fade Rotha uh, by making sure he isn't poisoned. So that's like his way to try and drive a wedge between the Baron and Fade. And I guess once again, that's a character I can't imagine, you know, if they gave you the big moment of, look, Thurfi is still alive. Half the audience would have been like, who's that? So yeah. I don't I don't hate that decision. I know a lot of people are frustrated by it, especially because Denise says he's not going to do uh, an extended cut. And they did film scenes with uh, Thurfier and Tim Blake. Yeah. And Tim Blake. Do we know what role he was supposed to play? No, it's still not revealed. Uh, this question here from B. Allen. That cave scene was very much kill the boy. Let the man be born. Yeah. Very, very similar. What cave scene? Well, when he drank the when Paul drank it. I think he's when he gives a speech to all the Fremen. Oh, that. Yeah, and I guess also the water of life scene. Yeah, that could be it too. Dude, I fucking love that scene, man. She's just like, slow down, Paul. He's like, nah. I, I want to rewatch doing. just that scene again. I'm pointing the way. Imagine commanding a room like that. Dude, you got so cocked. Like, that's the thing I was talking about, like, one of them sees downfall. Basically, be like, yo, if any of you step to me, I'll fucking wash you. I'm the leader. I'm the Duke. I'm, I'm the all big the dog now. I love the ego of all the Fremen. They all pulled out their knives. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like everybody in that room believes he's the messiah and as soon as he stepped to them they were like wait a minute you talking like that to me <laughs> <laughs> even Chani and Stilgar like moved towards him <laughs> like we'll fuck you up too bitch <laughs> Chani was like oh. yeah. <laughs> 1v1 right now dude and even like when they first enter the siege um, and half of the crowd is jeering at him calling him a false prophet and the other half's worshiping him. Just the oh, look yeah. on his face and Lady Jessica and even Stilgar, like they're all so uncertain as to what to do. He's asking the elders for advice. It's still just so up in the air at that point. And that's th- those are moments that I felt were missing in the first Dune. Just moments of chaos where you're not really sure op- what's going to happen. The only option is like, yeah, well, either he's a messiah or we kill him. <laughs> So <laughs> they kept going back to that. When he was riding the worm, he was like, Shai Halud decides whether today you're a Fremen or you die. Uh, or even so that's uh, Jessica, too. So if I, if I don't want to be your uh, reverend mother, what happens? Well, then we got no <laughs> <Yeah>. use for you. <laughs> they kept just going back to that one bargaining chip. Well, if then you don't you do die. this, we, we could kill you. Uh, this question here from It's Your Boy, CK. If concluded right, 
Will this be the greatest trilogy of all time? All right, let's, so let's say that uh, part three is as good as part two. Is this the best trilogy of all time? I think it, it could be, yeah. No. I think it could be better than maybe Dark Knight. If part three is as good as part two. Uh, maybe better than Dark Knight. Maybe better than original Star Wars. That would be close, but I don't think it will ever... It couldn't be better than Lord of the Rings. And that's because of how good number one was? I just think all three are perfect, yeah. in my opinion. So, like, I, I do love part two, and I do think it's a perfect movie. Part one, very good, not beating any of the Lord of the Rings. So, it could, it could be close, though. I mean, the reaction to this has been tremendous, even... I think it's already better than Batman. <sighs> what What do you mean? One and two. The Dark Knight? Yeah. And versus Dark Knight and Batman Begins in these two? Yeah. Maybe. I don't hate that. It's close. It's not better and than the Lord of the Rings right in, now. The fact that it's even in this conversation already is insane. That's just how good the second one is. Because after the first one, I don't think people were really expecting to put it in the upper echelon of these great trilogies. But I think part two, that's what it's that good where it does immediately put it in that conversation. If three turns out to be just as special as part two. Because I think this one made number one a better world building movie because they right they went but, back on so much stuff in part two that made one better. Well, one's wholly necessary, but yeah. Um, for me, I looked back at one. I'm like, I might have to lower the score because I just think that part two is that much better than part one. Do you want to lower part one? Knowing that like part two exists and how much better it is in every single way, it makes you kind of look at part one like, yeah, definitely necessary. Still a good movie, but. I think there's it's just a completely different level. Honestly kills me that I bumped up part one to a four star and didn't keep it at three and a half. <laughs> so oh you can't God. go back. No, yeah, because no. it does feel like I mean, especially with me, it's not even you're saying it wasted part one? No, like there was a lot of those a lot of shit that they could have done better in one. Oh, sure, more, definitely. Yeah, no, there's way more, more, more criticisms of one, even it being a four star movie. It's just so ambitious and it looks incredible and it's Dune. It's kind of like what Aaron would say about some of the DC movies or other superhero movies. If they're not great, but if it's characters you love, you're going to like it a little bit more. Right. Uh, that's kind of, kind of how I feel with part one. And I think for a lot of people just being introduced to the world, they were absolutely blown away by the world building and the details. And people love all that shit. But part two, just uh, it just moves better. You you know it right from the first couple of scenes. Like we're yeah. on a journey here where it's going to have a uh, an ending, unlike part one that just kind of ends in the middle. Like there's there's just more purpose. It's being told with more purpose. Like I said, it, I, I said this to you last night. It's not a step above part one, but it's definitely an improvement. I do agree yeah, that part one shouldn't have ended there. where it ended. Part one should have concluded a different way. Like I felt like the the movie was just starting and it and it ends. I think part one could have ended almost like um with less of a. Make sure you come on back because that's kind of how that final scene feels when you see the person riding in the distance and Chani's like, this is just the beginning. I think if it would have ended e even more weird, weirdly, because you have the part one in the beginning, people know that part two is coming. So end it in a place that's even like more abrupt if you're going to go with the, the middle ending. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a place in the first act of part two where it could have ended. Maybe if you kind of have meet the Fremen. Right. And Lady Get Jessica drinks the water of life and it just ends after her like just being on a different becoming like a different person. I don't know. It's tough to find these things. No, because it is even tough. when you're going back to watching too, like rarely does a movie just have so like very clear and concise and satisfying ends to, and beginnings to acts. Like the end of Act One, him writing the the worm, like such a fucking incredible moment. That could be like that could be a movie ender, you know? So yeah, it's it's really tough to kind of go back and think like, yeah, maybe this would have been a good place to end it or they should have added this from part two into part one and that would have been more satisfying. At this point, it doesn't really matter because I think part two is so good that in the way it connects to part one and how you can kind of just view it as one five and a half hour epic. Yeah, I think part one's also being told with a, maybe this isn't the right word, but a, an almost nervousness of having to get out so much information and establish the world. And people have argued in the past that one thing Denis struggles with at times are dialogue scenes. And I thought his dialogue scenes in part two were such an improvement 
But I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that once again, that the story is headed towards a definitive conclusion and they're building towards this, this main theme. Whereas part one, it's just uh, a lot of people in rooms and you're not really convinced that they've known each other for longer than, than when the movie first started. And once again, like the think, ca- casting of Gurney Halleck, I think could have been a big improvement for part one. There's a comfort, I think. Like you, you talked about it on the spoiler free um, with Denis Villeneuve. And I think the part of it is like, yeah, one isn't considered to be at the level of two, but I think most people agree that he did a good enough job where he definitely established something here and brought us to this world in a very convincing and effective way where once he got that out of the way, it's like, okay, now I can relax. I can breathe a little and have a little more fun, take a little bit more chances and do a little bit different things in this one, because there's no worry that can I film the unfilmable? Will it be a success? Will I be allowed to make the second one? There's so much uncertainty going into that one, whereas a lot of that really wasn't the case going into part two. And he's like, fuck it. I'm going to kind of do what I want for it. Yeah. I think if Gurney was a character that got introduced in this one and wasn't even in part one, you might have gotten the the more whimsical type Gurney that you wanted from the book. Yeah, I think so. More reluctant to take a chance in this one than in the first one. Right. Yeah. You you have Josh Brolin. You're going to want him to just act like Josh Brolin because nobody (laughs) gives a shit. You know, you're trying to get the audiences in that aren't really going to be too upset about Gurney Halleck not being an ugly, ugly lump of a man. <laughs> he always come back to that. Well, apparently you he's get, not. Te- you get meaner. Say that again. <laughs> you get meaner and meaner every time. You bring no, up that's Gurney that's you actually wanted. the physical description from the book. That's the actual description. <laughs> That's the only know, description. way you're saying it. You keep coming back. Like, to oh, it, it yeah, maybe worse. a little more, a little more fatter. Then you're like, oh, a little bit more like, you know, jollier, dancing, singing. <laughs> this time you're like, oh, just a fat lard. <laughs> well, I, apparently I read him as fat and he's not technically fat. He's just like not ripped. It's just hmm. like in a dad bod. Yeah, that's the thing, dude. Like if you would have got, um, once again, Don Lee from the Roundup movies or from Inter- Eternals to someone who's buff, you know? Like he can't move him off of his spot, even with Josh Brolin. I'm like, yeah, he he's got a great face. He's a great actor, but th- yeah, someone honestly, someone but, could like set the edge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I'll I'll tell you what though. Like in part two, I kind of got over it because I was like, yo, Josh Brolin really is just such a great actor, <laughs> and like here he is again in the supporting role and got a great voice, great delivery. It, it kind of makes up for it. It's similar with uh, David Lynch's Dune. It's like, yeah, once again, Gurney, ugly lump of a man. Who do they cast? Patrick Stewart. <laughs> They refuse to let Gurney be ugly. But once again, it's Patrick Stewart. Uh, this one here, funny question here from Dom. Is Paul going to become a bad guy? He seems like a bit of a dick by the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be know, like if, if you want to follow Paul, he's not the bad guy. You know, depends who you want to follow, I feel like. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> yeah, point. That's a great way to look at it. Ted. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't think Paul's a bad guy. I think he's doing what's necessary. You're the bad guy. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's... It's the Harkonnen who was a bad guy, you know? Oh, yeah, I think I'm bad. Like, remember the Harkonnens? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. reminds me of, like, old-time Rome. It was ruthless. Little Athens versus Sparta dynamic going there. Well, I think Lady Jessica, definitely in this movie, could be viewed as more of the at villainous than, I guess, Paul. That's what I didn't like, is that they made her out to be the villain. Oh, I like God. You're, you're such a... It's, like, the best part <laughs> of the movie. <laughs> you're like when Jesse doesn't want to... Uh kill lydia and breaking bad it's like come on she's she's just a woman <laughs> yeah i mean and mike's her. like she deserves to die as any other man <laughs> lady jessica's clearly the the driving force uh if anything she's got way more of a claim of being an antagonist than it's Paul his mom does. it's it's his mom, mom and she's hot come on <laughs> i mean johnny could have Digging into her, she's like, "You're a fucking psychopath. You poison yeah, your she own was kid." Taking digs every every time she could. I bet you Jessica wanted to kill her, but she couldn't because of Paul. Oh yeah, she hates Johnny. Yeah. Who do you think made Rebecca Ferguson cry? I forgot. There was a. They were saying it could have been The Rock, but probably not. I can't imagine The Rock talking that way. Whoever it was, I better hope they don't Fastbender come across me. I don't care if it was The Rock too. I'll beat his ass. Fastbender seems. I'm more scared of Fastbender than I would The Rock. Fuck them both up. Fastbender seems like a guy who kills you with gloves on because he doesn't like blood. <laughs> Not even because he's trying to hide his fingertips. He's just it's about being cleanly. Momoa uh, Duncan should have been in this one. <laughs> Dude, honestly, a part of me was like, 
That's a damn yeah. shame. I do this with like uh, Game of Thrones too. I'm like, man, imagine Ned Stark was just at the wall doing wall stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I, in my head, I was like, imagine Duncan was just running around with these boys. Oh, Duncan would have been so hype. I know, uh, dude. No, it would have been uh, heartbreaking for Duncan to see what happened to his boy. Like, to see Paul that way, I think Duncan would have been a little scared. You're not happy my, for Paul? Well, th- I think, um, I don't I'm know. I'm happy. He's been working happy that he's, I think it's ambiguous. I think it's something where, like like I said, like you're, you're obviously rooting for Paul in the vacuum of the story, but I think... Everyone wanted Ooh. this change, and now the change happens, and what, now it's too much for you guys? We're not talking about that. We're talking about the the prophecies and what Paul says in the movie numerous times, what he's scared of. Yeah, and what we Johnny- knew it was going to happen. We know he's been saying it, and we've still wanted him to become the Krizak Hatterax, and, and it happens, and now what? Nobody wants it anymore? Whatever happens, happens, man. Well, for the fans, yeah, I mean, that's part of being a fan, and that's what's fun about the stories. Once again, like uh, George R. R. Martin said, his villains would never be like orcs, ugly, disgusting. It's so obvious that they're the bad guys, and the Harkonnens are like that. The bald heads, the depravity, they're obviously the bad guys, right? But then your typical hero's journey ends up being even worse than that. But he's pretty. He's got blue eyes. He's got beautiful hair. His mom's hot. His dad's hot. Is he is he kind of the villain now? It so it's fun. It's like yet. a combination where he gets uh, his little Lord of the Rings villains where they're clearly bad guys. But the good guys are just as willing to go down those darker paths. The and six it's billion like, people hasn't died yet, by the way, guys. We're jumping the gun here. Well, I think it's more of a... It's, it's just not clear cut. It's not clear villain and clear hero like we're used to. It's a little bit more muddy, a little more gray. And I think that's a fun way to explore... A character like Paul, because he still is, like you said, like in this movie, like when he rises up and gets revenge and kills Fade and takes control, you're like, you're like, fuck yeah. But then you kind of realize, oh, well, where is this headed? Where is this going to spiral to? It's going to keep building and building, you know, and that's when you remember all the other things and all the warnings from before and how what Chani's perspective on things and how she feels about it. Like, and then you uh-huh. kind of paint the picture and you're like oh yeah maybe this isn't as clear-cut surface level as i thought it was or we give him benefit of the doubt and think he and hope he figures it out he's got a good sure, head on maybe. his shoulder yeah maybe he's just like you know it's like all this stuff all this death nah holy war not on my watch no you could it could happen it could happen yeah well, the answer to the question, I think Paul's a good guy. Yeah, and that's the other thing with power. Like, if you do all that to gain power and then you don't use it, somebody's going to take it from you. So, like, what Paul's going to set up... they can't up, uh, take it from him. He's a god. They can't take no, it from him. No, but if he decided, okay, you know what? We're not going to do a holy war. We're just going to stay on Arrakis. Then the other great houses are going to plan to obliterate you on Arrakis. Like, it just Teddy doesn't Stol- stop because you want it to stop. Teddy and Stilgar are on a fucking slurp fest right now. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that's part of the cautionary tale, and there's a lot of lessons I think he's trying to uh, pass through his story south, here. <laughs> Come on. But it's once you go down this road, it's not so much, you know, it's a, it's a downward slope. Once you take that final step, you're rolling, baby, like a goddamn fucking wrecking ball. And that's the thing, you know, that was the naivete of Duke Leto, like, oh, we'll, we'll do it differently. We'll make an alliance with the Fremen. That's worse. Yeah. Look what well, happens. It's like- <laughs> It's all about how you frame things. I mean, obviously in a story like Star Wars, you know, Luke is just viewed as the ultimate good. But if you set the story in perspective from like a family that's on the Death Star, just like. <laughs> he's a terrorist. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> he's a war. Yeah, he's a little war criminal. It's like I'm the wife of the, the head custodian. Yeah, but I'm there's raising more, my. There's more. Like three bro. kids. No, Luke Skywalker I know, but- massacred millions of people, dude. It's like if you were a citizen of Marine when Daenerys came and fucking, <laughs> like, living your day-to-day, you'd probably be like, huh. And we don't know how many people died on Alderaan, dude. Those numbers are coming from the Rebels. Those aren't... Yeah. We can't <laughs> trust those pumped. numbers. Yeah, no. <laughs> so. It's all about perspective. Dude, Hunter, Hunter just farted. I think a dog's fart is probably one of the worst smells, like it's a top five lethal. smell in the world. Uh, this one here from like, B.R. Hine. They're like bombs. <laughs> best format to watch doom part two i saw it in dolby and was blown away dolby is a good format i heard people say like if you can't do f- real imax then dolby's better than 
fake IMAX. A hundred percent. Yeah, you get better sound. I'm not the person that asked for this. I'd rather watch it on like a. <laughs> I, I can watch it on a TV screen. But happy. did you like that uh, RPX? Oh, my fucking body was shaking. Are you kidding? I don't know what kind of bass they pumped in that place. Dude, talk about... When, remember when the ceiling panel fell? Luckily, they oh, didn't yeah. hit anybody. Yeah. I, I mean, what, why couldn't that be me? <laughs> Dude, the, the movie starts like two minutes in, and a ceiling panel just falls on an empty seat. And everyone's like, what Dude. the fuck? And Teddy's like, are you fucking kidding me? Why couldn't that be me? <laughs> Dude, there's a telephone pole that someone hit. That's been like crooked ever since. And every time I go by it, I'm like, please fucking crush me. (laughs) Just give me the lawsuit, man. Everyone else gets them. Why can't I get a lawsuit? Yeah, I'm excited because I'm going to see it uh, Tuesday in the Lincoln Center IMAX. How many times um, is that for you? This would be number five. (laughs) I say I want to save it, but like, because I don't want to be my, the 70 millimeter to be like my fifth time seeing it or sixth. I kind of still want it to be like a fresh experience, but then now it's, that's going to take like four weeks to get a ticket. So I think I might just do RPX next and then hopefully get 70 millimeters somewhere down the line before it leaves theaters. Yeah. If you're in the New York area, even if you're in Jersey or Connecticut, if you're close, it's worth it to take like an hour, hour and a half, even two hour day trip. To Dude, that's watch a fucking a eight hour day trip right there. <laughs> you're already uh <laughs> it's not even for you it's for like other people that maybe <laughs> would be willing to do that you're already exhausted <laughs> <laughs> it's an eight hour day you gotta plan that out it's a no i'm saying movie. yeah plan it out uh you know just even in the future like if people are in the area dude because i know some people will take Oppenheimer? trips like how did we get that friday oppenheimer looking back on it because you cannot get anything for doing right now on the weekend oh that oppenheimer i think we bought it immediately as it went on sale Oof, that was clutch and then I fucking missed it. <laughs> that was terrible. Oh, that's an all-time day for me. I'm, I'm glad you, you had see fun. It? I saw Oppenheimer in the city, and then I went to see Barbie at Alamo in Brooklyn. Nice. That was fucking. We were supposed to have this beautiful day together, and he had to go and get sick. Yeah, I got COVID. That was the first time <laughs> I had COVID, actually. Damn. Uh, this question you here fucking... from... Go ahead. You fucking sand walked around that shit. Oh, yeah, dude. The sand walking just makes me laugh every time I see it. Because uh, when Chani did her sand want... walk and Teddy immediately ad libbed it. Yeah, every time I see it, I want to be like, hey! Chani's <laughs> 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 sand walk well, was kind of the sand walk, and now they're both doing it. So doesn't that make it like, because the, the, the sand, the worms come to like repetitive, no? Well, if they're mimicking the sounds of the desert. That's what nah, I'm not looking. I'm not looking too into it. Yeah, don't think too much into it. Uh, this question here: <laughs> Teddy stomping around the desert. <laughs> <laughs> this is in worm territory. <laughs> territory. <laughs> Just worms coming from every which way. <laughs> this question here from Nelly: Should uh, Chani break up with Paul? No, you got to ride this out. Maybe you know, take a ride, get your mind off things, think, reflect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, you can you can take a breather, you know, but you got to come back to Big Daddy. <laughs> God, you really are just uh totally Dick bought in. Insane. Yeah, you're glazing this man. You see Princess Erlin, it's like, wait a minute. Maybe these arranged still, marriages aren't so bad. Still guy getting ready for a glazing competition, then he realizes his opponent's Teddy. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. What's that supposed to mean? He's confident he's gonna win. No one's glazing more than I do. It's like oh, who am I going against? Oh, you're uh, saying that oh. <laughs> Yeah. Hey man, when the shit goes down, I want the uh, I want to be on the right side. <laughs> the right side? You mean the winning side? Yeah, the right side. Winning side. What the fuck's the difference? Uh, this question here from IB one two eight three. Final question. Oh no, sorry, IB. Uh, we already asked your question. Somebody else kind of asked it. This one from it's your boy CK. Another one from CK. Can we get your guys' power rankings for the actors' performances? So I guess maybe we'll do uh, top three, top five. Uh, number one for me was definitely uh, Austin Butler. And Lady think? Jessica. Those are would yeah. be my top two. And then Stilgar would be my top three. I think it's Chalamet, Ferguson, Butler. Probably my top three. I mean, if I go five, I'll put Zendaya in there as well. And uh, yeah, I guess you got to go with... Uh, I'm trying to think of like, someone else. I'd say... Yeah, Javier Bardem, obviously, yeah. Yeah, for some yeah, people Chalamet there are five. weak performances, but for me there aren't. Chalamet, Bardem, and Rebecca. Now you're on a first name basis with her. Wait, what? You want the names of the? You, chill, you chill. Butchered her first name. Yeah, dude. Like even just looking at the cast once again, I loved 
the girl who played Johnny's friend. And Austin Butler. You're to glazing me was... her and you're fucking saying shit to me about glazing Paul. <laughs> well, I just love the supporting characters that are, are able to leave an impression like that because they just bring the world to life. I don't know why, but there's the one look when Paul's like, you know, half the people here worship me. And it's the guy eating his food, smiling at Paul. He just looked like such a cute old man. <laughs> He's like, hey there, Mr. Messiah. <laughs> Please bring back the trees and oceans. <laughs> But she was great. And also Leah Sado as uh, Margot, Lady Margot. Awesome. The voiceover when she's going back and forth with uh, oh, Fade yeah, Rotha. she's in her head. I hope it was a pleasant yeah, dream. And then outside <laughs> of it. Don't mock me, woman. That's crazy. No, she perfect voice, dude. When she's watching and she's giving us her commentary, like, oh, that, that slave isn't drug. What's going on? She's like, plants within plants. What a shitty birthday present. We didn't really talk about that black sun. That's my favorite performance. Oh, awesome. Were those like fucking weird ass fireworks? <laughs> yeah, they were just like, I don't know what the hell. I think that's awesome. Like, I think that's fire. That's, that's supposed to be like fucking creepy fireworks. Yeah, she mentioned she calls them fireworks. She's like, oh, you're not celebrating. Harkins can't even get fucking fireworks to look majestic look nice. and like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like nice. It's depressing. Just an ugly fucking Rorschach splatter in the sky. Is that who I picked for the, uh, <laughs> the, the family I want to be on, Les Harkonnen. Like, did I pick the Sardaukar or did I pick the yeah, I think uh, you did. Harkonnen? You were all yeah, over the place, dude. You had no idea. <laughs> You're talking about you want to be on the right side. You don't even know what side that is. I saw I lost the next movie. You kidding? So apparently, Austin Butler uh, improvised that kiss. Oh God, that was weird. With Stellan? Yeah, and then Stellan gave him a kiss <laughs> right back. <laughs> You're not going to outdo me. Down. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you some tongue. <laughs> Reminded me of uh, Birdman and Lil Wayne kissing. That's why Austin Butler is one of my favorites working today because he's just such a lunatic when it comes to his He roles. is the role that he played in this one. <laughs> he's just, he's psychotic. But even like the, the commitment for Elvis became such a meme because he couldn't lose the voice. But I like act. He reminds me of Pattinson. You know, they're little weirdos. They really love their craft. They take it too far, but in a way that's not annoying. I guess for some people it is. But uh, once again, the ridiculous voice. Nobody knows what accent that is. I saw a review on Letterboxd. They were like, why was uh, Fade Rotha speaking with a Hispanic accent in some scenes? <laughs> Dude was uh, Latinx on Gaty Prime. All right, well, before we wrap it up, any last uh, thoughts, declarations? Declaration. Projections? Oh, I got Paul in three. <laughs> I can't wait to see the... The Freeman's reactions when they get to Arrakis and see what Arrakis looks like. The who's? Wait, when, what? And the, the third one when they get to Arrakis, not Arrakis. Uh, Caladan. Caladan, yeah. Oh yeah, dude, they're gonna be like, no way, y'all got hot tubs. <laughs> y'all heat up the water. <laughs> they would hate. Oh, Aaron. Uh, by the way, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, happy birthday, man. The Freeman would fucking like when I leave my faucet on to brush my teeth instead of turning it off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll kill you. You know how thirsty, like, I know that you can survive with the still suit, but they must be just incredibly thirsty all the time. It's like when you're breathing underwater with a, a snorkel. What is it called? Yeah, the snorkel. Like, you think, oh, I can breathe, but it sucks. It's like, <laughs> it's not great air that you're breathing. <laughs> like, it's no, really difficult. I just did that. Well, I wish they, like, they weren't, they weren't as sweaty as I like them to be. I feel like they should have been fucking drenched the whole time. I guess it's a testament to the still suits. Well, it's what the still, still suits, suits though. Yeah. It captures the, yeah. yeah. That is crazy that you can just be walking in the desert shit in your pants. Oh, the puke. When he says, don't puke. <laughs> don't let oh, it yeah, down. Yeah, <laughs> right yeah, now, and all the Fremen tents and all that stuff. Amazing. Right now it's got a 9 in IMDb, which would make it, I think, the fifth best movie of all time. No movie's ever going to beat Shawshank. It's crazy though. That's the it's 9. 9. 3. 4 on, uh, nine point four on nine point four. It's ninety four on Rotten Tomatoes it's right the now. People's movie. Well, technically, right now it's twelve at nine, but Forrest Gump is at eleven of eight point eight. But I think if like the Dark Knight's at three with a nine, also, so it's at a four point six on Letterbox. What's the next movie, man? I'm back in the theater. Oh no, dude! What a bad <laughs> year for this. Every yeah. movie's being pushed back. <laughs> Every movie sucks. The only good thing is fucking Dune right now. Really? Yes. <laughs> There's so many major movies that are being pushed back because of uh, it's definitely because of the strike. Am I really so I'm not I'm not getting back to the theater till part three comes out. Are you out. a Ghostbusters guy? No. All right. Are you a Sydney Sweeney guy? I am. She got a new movie coming out. I mean I wouldn't go see it. <laughs> maybe uh maybe Godzilla and Kong. Have you seen Oppenheimer yet? No. Go see Oppenheimer. 
All right, guys, that does it for our ep- this episode of Nerd Soup, our Dune spoiler discussion. Thank you, Aaron and Teddy, for joining me. Uh, I can't imagine this will be the last time we talk about this movie, and it's a movie Ooh, yeah. that warrants uh, further discussion. So, any gonna, last thoughts, gonna, Aaron and Teddy? Are we going to Dune 2? We're doing two podcasts? <laughs> Uh, okay well that was that was funny uh teddy any you gotta i'm I'm good at this you (laughs) you know how i'm not like big on seeing movies twice and there's a chance i see this one again i buy that i would say there's a at least a 15 percent chance which is which is up from zero wow that was probably our best review yet hey guys aaron the nerd suit monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make nerd soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.